Hello, everybody. Welcome to Finding Your Future. I'm your host, Parker Wagnode, and today I have my very first guest, Dr. Dwayne Priester. He's been an educator for 24 years, and he is a professor for North Arizona College. And 24 years is a long time. It's almost twice as long as I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks. So I have a series of questions that I want to ask you because I'm very curious. So um, I'm just going to hop right into it. So, okay. let's, so the first question is, when you were a teacher for many years, how does being a principal differ from being a teacher? The level of responsibility changes dramatically. And, and the, I think the thing that I sometimes describe is there's a little bit of a, it's, it's, I, I miss being a teacher because I'm a, another level removed from the students. And I'm always reminded of why I got into this business is because I enjoy being around students. So, so much of my job now is really focused on dealing with adults and it's outwardly facing. That's good. So, do you think like dealing with kids is what impacted you to become a principal? Oh, sure. You know, when I, in the classroom, I, I, I really enjoyed that one-on-one -on -one interaction, the feedback that I got from students, the opportunity to watch them yeah. learn and grow. And, um, but sometimes what happens is you'll get a, you'll get a principal who'll come into your room and say, hey, I, I think you'd be a good principal. Oh. And that, <laughs> that was the beginning of my journey. Uh, that's nice. So how did you get the job at Mid Pacific Middle School principal? Like, how did that, like, come along? I was working at Hawaii Preparatory Academy on Hawaii Island. And a friend of mine um, mentioned that there was an opening here on Oahu at this particular school. And I knew a lot about Mid-Pacific. I knew a lot about the changes that were happening here. The fact that the, the head of school at the time was very aggressive and he was very forward-facing and it's a school that I wanted to be a part of. The other contributing factor was my wife is from Oahu, so um, a lot of her family's here. So that was a big incentive too because she really wanted to come home and be around her family. That's, that's um, a good um, story. <laughs> So do you like your job, and what about it do you like about it? Like, what do you like about well, it? Well, I love it. I love it. It, um, you know, I, I just enjoy getting out of bed every morning, knowing that I get a chance to come and work with students. I get a chance to work with um, incredible teachers and administrators, people who are very forward-facing. They think much like me in that they are very focused on the future and how we can provide the best for our students. So um, the response to your question is, what is the thing that really drives me or what makes it so interesting? And it's just, it's the students and the, and the people that I get to work around. That's great. And do you have any, like, challenges? Like, what things, like, help you or hurt you about being a principal? I mean, the challenge, I think the challenge is, for me, is um, I serve a population of students who they're much younger than I am, and they're getting younger every year as I get older. So um, there's, there's a challenge in keeping pace and making sure that what I'm doing is really matching what they need for the future, and really making sure that we are adequately addressing the needs of students like yourself. That's the, that's the big challenge that I deal with, is really just making sure that I'm on pace. That's, well, you made a great point. So, like, what, what was so far, like, the biggest challenge you've ever had, like, the biggest setback as a principal? That's a tough question. Wow. <laughs> um, I threw a fastball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the biggest challenge that I've had or the thing that I've faced is you get to a point in your career that you recognize that you will make mistakes. As educators, we always want to get it right. And as a principal, the the expectations to get it right increase dramatically. And coming to the realization that there are times when I don't always get it right. There are times when I have to take a step back and say, I didn't get it right, right this time, and ask myself the question, what will I do differently next time? And be willing to put myself out there and be vulnerable. And that's kind of the same way for like us students, because like there will be challenges and we need to overcome them. Right, right, so right. It's pretty neat. Right. It's okay. And, and, and I say this to the teachers all the time, as well as the students. It's okay to make mistakes. As a, as a matter of fact, sometimes mistakes are a good thing because we learn and we grow as a result of those mistakes. 
That's great. So how has technology innovative at MAPAC been going? Like, how, how has it been? Are you, like, for it or oppose it? Cause oh, very much so. Very much so. So um, a, lot of what we, a lot of what we've done, especially over the course of the past 15 years, is really try to make sure that what we are doing in terms of technology is really, it's, it's going to serve our students and serve our students well. Um, we, we're very much focused on making sure that we have a very solid academic program. As a matter of fact, the academics really under, underpin the technology. But the thing that we want to make sure as we progress as a society, and we know that society is changing dramatically all the time, we want to make sure that the changes that we're making are at the right pace, and not just pacing along, but really thinking forward. And for us, that technology represents the future of our students. So, uh, we know that our students are wired in all the time, so how do we make the most of that? How do we teach our students to be responsible users, to know how to access that technology, but access it in ways that they really are effective users and they're responsible users also? Um, if you've seen, mm -hmm. I, on Saturday, I've recorded something here about like technology at MIPAC, mm -hmm. and I'm all for it. Like I feel that students can use it to like access emails and like do their homework and stuff, and I feel it's a great way not only to like the school, but it can help save paper. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was pretty cool. How did you guys like make the deal with Apple? It's you know it's a, I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of that story. We we went to a one to one iPad, um, one-to-one device, and we chose the iPad several years ago. But prior to making that decision, we spent a lot of time, probably five years before, just discussing what we thought would be the best platform for our students. We knew that we were moving, moving to an increasingly, increasingly mobile world, and the decision to go laptops, excuse me, go iPads as opposed to laptops we, be, we felt at the time, and it was the right feeling to have, but we felt that that mobile device, something that was fluid, something that our students can take almost anywhere, and it was accessible, it's something that they can put in their hands, um, we felt that that would be the best use for them. The other thing, and you mentioned this all earlier, the use of paper, we also knew that we were moving towards, more towards a paperless society, and we wanted to be responsible users, as I mentioned earlier. So we chose the iPad just because we knew that that was a piece of technology that was, it was early, it was introduced early, but we knew that it was in the early stages of development. Yeah. Well, thanks for touching on that. I was uh, very curious about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So um, where do you see it going for the future? Like, what do you want MIPAC to look like 10 to 15 years from now? I... It's, it's hard to say what it will look like. What I want it to look like is an institution that's always responsive to the needs of our students. It's very easy for educators to become comfortable with where they are at the present time. It's also easy for us to look back on our experiences as, as young educators and, and our experiences as students and say this is what our students need to have in order to be successful. But I think as an institution, we need to continue to be nimble. We need to continue to, um, as, Ray, as Wayne Gretzky says, we need to anticipate where the puck is going so we can actually get there when we need to be there. Do you think you drew inspiration from your principal? Like, how did being a principal come along as far as being like also an educator? Like, mm -hmm. how, what like, inspired you to do that? Mm -hmm. Um, my high school principal was actually a, a colorful character, and, and I don't say that in a bad way. Um, he was very much um, in touch with his students. He, whenever he had a chance, he was in the classrooms, and he was on the athletic fields, and he took the opportunity to get to know who we were. And reflecting back on my high school experience, I... I, I said, if I was ever a principal, that's the kind of guy that I wanted to be. And um, I always wanted to have a good relationship with students. Oftentimes, principals have that reputation for people being the big, scary guy who kind of stays in their office all the time and only deals with discipline. I wanted an opposite experience. I wanted to be in the middle of students and 
as much as possible having an opportunity to work side my students, ask them what they're thinking, what they need, and then be responsive to those needs. I think you did like a great job because I don't Thank feel you. scared going into your office. Okay, I mean, good. only when like I do something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> all right, so like, what did you do as a kid? Like, what kind of, as far as academic, were you more like an ac academic person or a um, sports person or what were you? Or did you join like clubs? Hmm. Um, I, had a, I had a really interesting high school experience. Um, I, I like to say I got along with most groups of, group of students. Um, in high school, I was a football player and a wrestler. And, um, but in addition to that, um, I was an avid reader. I've always been a huge comic books fan. Um, but then there's another side of me, too, because I grew up along the coast. So I was a skateboarder and a surfer as well going through high school. So I had all of those experiences, and it was a very rich experience. So those, I think having relationships with different groups of friends, I could, I could have great conversations with those students who are very <laughs> academic, those students who are very athletic, and those students who are uh, sometimes where I come from, they were called the beach bums. <laughs> so I could, I could vacillate, vacillate in and out of those groups. Uh, that's very good to have, like, a lot of friends because that way you can, like, get more knowledge from them. Yes. And that's what I've learned because I've started myself with a lot of different friends. Yes. And they, they all have unique, like, lifestyles. So I'm going to um, touch on another question. How did... How did the Northern Arizona University job come along? Like, how did that come along? Because we know that's a long way to get to Hawaii from there. Yeah. Um, we were, we lived in Arizona for seven years. Seven years, yes. Yeah. Seven years we lived there. And I started as a teacher, then became an assistant principal and a principal. And the school district that I was working in, one of my colleagues taught afternoon classes for Arizona University and at the time I was entering a doctoral program and um, he suggested, he said, hey you should pick up a class here or there. So I started teaching one class for Northern Arizona University as an adjunct professor and um, then it picked up into two classes and the three classes. So I worked for them for a number of years. Um, so that's how that came about. and. It was an opportunity, I felt that it was an opportunity for me to not only touch my students, but also get a chance to impact those teachers who were going into, or the potential teachers, as they were going into the business of educators. I, I wanted them to have a real world look into what schools were actually like, as opposed to just that university perspective. Well, thanks for telling me more about that. Um, we have a break coming up, okay. so. I'll see you guys after this break. All right. You can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. So I'm going to um, throw a question at you that I actually want to know. Um, so I'm interested in video production, mm -hmm. and I said that on another live show we did at Think Tech. 
So what is what does the future hold for like some person like me who loves video stuff? So we have very deep roots in video at Mid Pacific. Um, as you know, Mr. Takuda, who is the middle school video teacher, um, he's now that we we call it now digital media. He's he's been a long time. Um, He's worked at a number of stations here in Hawaii. He's been teaching video for a number of years. And, and interestingly enough, we've taken an, we've taken an interesting turn in video at Mid-Pacific. Um, on the one hand, it looks like we've pulled back. But um, on the other, we're now actually going much deeper. Video has evolved. And one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that our video program is keeping pace with what's happening at the industry level. So when you look at video at Mid-Pacific now, as opposed to five, six years ago, we're now starting to get into the digital, digital side of video. Um, we're starting to bring in different elements, like, um, like 3D technologies and, and how that will interface with video. So as our students are actually transitioning out of middle school into high school, you will go much deeper into video. And as you go into um, high school, into the university, or high school into work, They'll, you'll, you'll actually have a much broader, rich experience in video, so you'll be that much more prepared. And, you'll actually, and it, there's a certain level of thinking that comes with that as well. And we want to make sure that as we prepare our students, that they, uh, they have a breadth and a depth of knowledge in that area. So since I have you here on the spot, let me ask you a middle school experience. Were you more of a good student, or were you more of a rebel? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, you know, to be honest with you, and I think this is why I, one of the reasons that I enjoy being a principal so much, um, as, as, my, as my wife says, I was a little bit rascally. I was Chloe in, in high school. <laughs> um, not in a bad way, but I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed my surroundings, and I liked having fun. Sometimes I had too much fun. So um, because, I, because of that experience and because I was on both ends, um, I now have a better um, understanding of how to work with my students. And, and, and I understand that at this particular age, students like to push the boundaries a little bit. But that's just, it's, it's part of being a student. So I have a lot of patience for that. And, and, and sometimes I actually smile and chuckle because I remember my days in high school. <laughs> OK. So um, what, do you, what did you like doing in middle school and high school? Did you play sports, or where did you go to school? So um, yes, I played, I played sports. And you know, it's interesting that you ask that question, because I think about, um, as I oftentimes reflect back on my high school experience, I was, a, I was an avid football player, and, and I really wanted to play college ball. Um, I'm a little too short for what I wanted to do, but I was always very aggressive. And because I injured myself in high school, or I was injured in high school, um, wrestling was my fallback. So I ended up wrestling in college, but I knew that there was not a professional career in wrestling. So as I moved out of high school into the university, um, I, I really started to focus more on my academics because I knew that there had to be life beyond sports. So in your opinion, what makes Mid-Pack special? What puts it like, per se, Punahou? What makes it like? <laughs> Oh, there again. <laughs> um, you know the thing that, and I'll the thing that I'll talk about Mid Pacific. Um, the thing that really makes us unique. We are we are a school that we really do focus on the needs of our students. We really do focus on being one community as a school. The elementary, middle, and high school teachers work together. The middle, elementary, and high school principals work together. And we routinely have conversations about the needs of our students. And in those conversations, we're not afraid to change. We're not afraid to evolve. We're not so fixed in our positions that we don't recognize that next year may need to look different than it did this year. And I used the word earlier, and I think the word, one of the words that best describes us is that as a school, we're nimble. We are willing to make the adjustments when necessary. 
But we don't make those adjustments for adjustment's sake. We make those adjustments because it's in the best interest of our students. And when we look at their needs, we don't put our needs above the needs of our students. And I, I think that makes us unique. We really are this special community. And it's, and I, and I oftentimes have said, it's the uniqueness of our school is baked in our DNA. It's who we are. We've always done things that's different than other schools, and we're not afraid to continue in that direction, and we're not afraid to say that. So on to the next um, question I had. Mm -hmm. um, what motivates you to keep coming back to the school every day, and like, what motivates you to wake up every morning? I am, I am charged by all of the possibilities and the opportunities. The last two weeks, the three principals and I, we've been, we've been talking about what we're going to do for the coming year. Um, we talk about how we are going to move together as one unit, as opposed to our individual schools working in silos. Uh, we, have, we regularly have discussions with our head of school, um, Dr. Turnbull, who's also a visionary and, and um, other senior administrators. We have, we're always thinking about what's next and how we can best serve our students, how we can provide a professional learning environment for them. But ultimately, the thing that drives me is all of those decisions that we're making, we make it with our students in mind. That's the key. And we listen to, we, we make an effort to listen to what our students are asking us. So this is, um, <laughs> this is kind of like a funny one because I hope, I hope you could recommend me a little bit. So for me and my generation, mm -hmm. do you have any recommendations? I would say, you know, um, and I want you to hear this in the spirit that I'm saying it. I, for your generation, I would say don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to be a risk taker. And when I say, the, when I say fail, that means don't feel like you have to operate in your comfort zone. There are going to be things that are going to motivate you, things that you're deeply passionate about. And I would say pursue those passions with all of the spirit that you have. And understand that you may try five things, four may not go well, but that's okay. It's okay to push yourself forward. I would say um, embrace as many different peoples as you can. Ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to build relationships with people who think differently than you do, who do things that are different than you because that, in, that will enrich your life experience. That will open a number of pathways for you. So, um, ha so I know I'm gonna change the subject again a little bit. Okay. Um, has the past couple of years been difficult on the teachers? And, um, and is it like also difficult to accept the new technology in their classrooms? <laughs> Anytime you're over 35, something new is challenging. <laughs> um, so the short answer to your question is yes. It's been challenging for the teachers. It's been challenging for us as administrators. And I think the reason that it's challenging, um, we are, as educators, we are serving a population of students who are digital natives in that you grew up in this world of technology. We are immigrants. We, we were not born into this. So trying to understand it, trying to make sense of it, trying to make sure that we're doing the best for you, is it's a challenge for us. Um, uh, for years, and I used to describe my cell phones this way, when I, when I got a phone, my son would program it for me. Uh -huh. But now I learn that I have to learn to do that for myself, and I have to, I have to go after the technology. And, and I've said this to my faculty on a number of occasions, and I, because I, it's something that I live by, I said, you have to be comfortable with not being comfortable because it forces us to always change, evolve, and grow. Well, just, so you, I mean, are you, you're, you're working around this technology. What about you? Are you uh -huh. comfortable with it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. Like, mm -hmm. it's, some, it's a hobby of mine, mm -hmm. and I just loved it, and I keep on using it. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of became a hobby that I'll do, like, every day, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm pretty comfortable with it.
So in your, at Mid-Pacific, do you think that the teachers have served you well? Do you think that we are really providing you with the technology that oh, yeah. you need? Okay. It, it's great. <laughs> so um, moving on to um, your family, do, you get, do your kids um, consider you strict? <laughs> <laughs> yes. They, um, I have two sons, and um, I would say they did. And um, because I grew up with a very, I, I grew up with a mother who really, she kept close reins on us. She raised four children, and um, she wanted to make sure that we were always behaving and that we would be responsible, grew up to be responsible citizens. That's what she always told us. She, she did not want to hear that we were in trouble. And um, so she kept pretty tight reins on us. And for my sons, I wanted them to grow up and be responsible citizens as well. So I really kept tight reins on them. But I, I also gave them a little more freedom than my mother gave us. But um, I managed from a distance. So yes, and I, I now have grandchildren. And my wife and I, as much as we want to make sure that we tell our son how to raise his children, we have to back away. But he's starting to do some of the things that, that we're doing as well. Nice. So I have one final question to ask you, and then but we can just wrap this up. So okay. what, what does the future hold for you? Well, um, I, you know, I, I feel like I have a lot of good years ahead of me. Um, I hope you think so, too, as a student. <laughs> um, I have a lot of good years ahead of me, and I, I'm, I'm deeply passionate about what I do. Um, I, I had this conversation with my wife earlier, um, as a matter of fact, this weekend, and, and um, both, her, both her and I are passionate about our work, and um, I love serving the students that I serve. Um, the teachers that I work with, they give me energy, I enjoy being around them, they challenge me, they force me to grow and to think. Um, I'm, in, I'm in no hurry to grow up, so I want to be in this business around kids as long as I can. Well, thanks for um, being on the first episode of Our Future, and I look forward to doing uh, another one with you soon. My pleasure. I look forward to it. Thanks. All right. Thank you.